From the reception room, Catherine heard the faint hum of the shower upstairs. She thought of him naked and shuddered. She looked into the kitchen and saw the bottle of wine and her stomach sank. He would have seen it as well. She went into the kitchen and picked up the wine and put it back in the fridge, then cleaned the glass in the sink. At school, Catherine hadn't been popular, unpopular or an in-betweener. She was an outsider. Most outsiders are outcasts because of some personality defect or because they're ugly, but Catherine was neither. Catherine was an outsider by choice. She didn't like the popular girls. She thought them loud, cheap and crass. She arrived at school a year late, in year eight, after her family moved closer to the city. She once lived in a small town called Hashtonbury, a town in Middle England, where everyone is white, where the streets are always clean and spring flower petals are everywhere, where people know each other by name. They say good morning on their trips to the butchers or while getting their morning paper. Though her dad loved it there, he moved his office to the city. He couldn't be bothered with a 45-minute drive each day. So he moved the family too, moving to the suburbs, into a four-bedroom, newly built house on the edge of town. Catherine immediately felt the difference in culture when she started her first day at school. The word she would use was trashy. Everything was common. The boys weren't so bad, but it seemed the thickest ruled the roost, which saddened her. At her old school, the cleverer you were, the higher esteem you were held in. The opposite was true here. The girls were worse. She hated their voices most. They were shrill and sharp. And when they laughed, they cackled. They chewed gum. She didn't believe it inhibited their pronunciation. But it didn't help it, and it looked awful. The dyed hair was done badly. It was too obvious. They didn't seem to be aware of their own complexions. Dying it whatever colour they fancied that week. At school, Catherine kept her distance, and she quickly got the name Snob, or Rich Bitch. But she didn't argue, and the ribbing wasn't too hard. Catherine didn't know this, but a major reason why it wasn't so bad was because she was very pretty. That could have exacerbated things, but in this instance, it helped. Because when she smiled, her pretty smile at them, it made them feel more ugly. So they soon stopped. Catherine made one friend. Her name was Tamara. She had been very quiet, and Catherine had seen her sitting alone in class, not saying a word. Tamara was black, which was very different for Catherine. She hadn't met many people from different ethnicities to herself. Tamara was very pretty. She moved like a mouse, and seemed to have trouble making eye contact with people. Catherine noticed she always had a book with her, literature. She would see her reading in form at the end of the day. She noticed the book, To Kill a Mockingbird, in her hands. Catherine got the book herself from the library and read it. She was shocked by the profanity, but was immersed. It was the first novel she read by herself. She finished it in a week, and approached Tamara one evening after school on their walk home. They talked about the book together, and from that day, they were inseparable. By the time they were in year ten, they were the most stylish girls in school. Not that any of their classmates could see it. They were concerned with tracksuits and alcohol, and who was sleeping with who. Catherine and Tamara were refined and elegant. They had both grown tall, long limbs with pretty smiles. The other girls hated them, but they didn't say a word. Deep down in their stomachs, they knew it was jealousy. The boys loved them, but didn't say a word. They were intimidated. They didn't drink alcohol. They smoked a little weed at Tamara's on the weekends, whilst working their way through the previous century's most famous albums, Fleetwood Mac, Pink Floyd, The Smiths. They didn't think they were better than everyone else at school, but they were trying to be better, more cultured, more learned. By the time it came to leaving school, they had done well academically, in the top two percentile of the school. But it was their characters that were far beyond their peers. They resembled girls in their twenties, not their teens. To them, their classmates were still like children. As Catherine dried the wine glass, she took an extra look to make sure it really was crystal clear. She put it away and took a cloth from under the sink and whacked vigorously at the mark on the table. She paused and began to think back at that girl at school, on her last day 
in her black skirt, with her socks pulled up over her knees, and her leather jacket. The future had been all hers. Now, she was scrubbing a table, fearing what a man might do if the mark remained there. Catherine waited until he was finished changing, then went upstairs. She got changed herself, not into something comfortable, something showy. He now expected her to change for dinner, like it was the 1920s. He had commented on her looking more like a slob every day. He expected her to dress up. It was one reason she felt scared when he entered the house that evening. She put on a black knee-length skirt and blue blouse. She applied lipstick and mascara, a delicate amount, not to be called a prostitute again, as he had two weeks ago. Later, she was cutting tomatoes and cucumber, then frying steak. In the living room, he was watching Monday Night Football. She heard him shout, which made her heart race. She didn't want to pry him from his game, but didn't want to serve him cold steak. So she threw the first one in the bin and peered into the living room. She recognised the teams on the TV. Man United vs Man City. She knew nothing about football, but understood it was a big game, a derby they called it. The time in the corner of the screen said 85 minutes had been played. As far as she was aware, he wasn't a fan of any particular club, but he did bet. Honey, said Catherine. What? said Michael, with his eyes glued to the screen. Dinner's going to be ready in ten minutes, if that's okay. That's fine. Catherine arranged the table, instinctively glancing at the spot where the wine glass and bottle had been earlier. There was no marks. She hated herself for looking. She lit the candles in the centre of the table and turned off the lights. The steak was done to perfection, medium rare. She made sure of it. She was getting more accurate to his needs every day. When Michael walked into the kitchen, she was unsure of his mood. He claimed he didn't support a team, but she noticed different results resulted in different behaviours. The difference was probably marginal, but with Michael, the margins mattered. What we got? Babe, said Michael. Steak and stilton with a little bit of salad on the side. Michael looked at his dinner. The flickering candlelight accentuated the brown shimmer of the steak. Good girl, said Michael, walking to the fridge. He took the bottle of wine out and brought it to the table. He placed it in front of Catherine and poured. I... She wanted to say she didn't want another glass, but she looked at his big pupils and tense jaw. He looked crazed, like a starved dog. Enjoy yourself, said Michael, making his way around the table, taking a seat. How was your day, dear? said Catherine. She hated that sentence. It was a, I've played all my cards in life sentence. It was a, I'll never make an enjoyable mistake again sentence. It was a death sentence. But Michael liked it. It played into his idea of the happy relationship. An obedient one. Nothing you'd understand, said Michael. Catherine laughed internally and could see the bewilderment on his face as he remembered the day. Facts, figures, quarters, timesheets. Everything he had no idea about. How was your day? said Michael, cutting into his steak. He hardly realised he'd said it. It was a reflex, just what people said. He then looked up and saw his girlfriend in the candlelight, the bruising on her face. Her beauty in the shade, the shading of her eye. It revealed a new vulnerability. Not so bad, Catherine murmured. The lie was obvious. It hung and glistened. Michael felt no shame. He was pleased by her obedience, her willingness to say what he expected. By the way, well done with this steak. You're getting closer. Hey, you know that new girl, Jessica? said Michael. I know of Jessica. You've mentioned her a few times, said Catherine. Yeah, she's doing bloody well. I literally don't have to do a thing now. So glad I got an assistant, said Michael, glaring, almost grinning. He talked about the pretty blonde often, and it used to make her jealous. But now, whoever she was, she was welcome to him. She's looking better every day as well, 
said Michael. Catherine looked up and saw his corrupt stare. So you had a word with her about her dress sense then? That's right, just like I did with you. It had to be done. It's not right for a woman to be going around wearing a polo top and trousers. Not for work. A big part of business is image. It just doesn't set the tone right, does it? I want my dad's business to be a place of class. Just like he left it. Yeah, that's it. That's what I said to her. Dress with class. So she's smartened up then? You could say that. She's up the sex appeal as well. I didn't tell her to do it, but I can't complain, said Michael, looking for her envy. I think you're looking better these days too. When we first met, you had that weird vibe, said Michael. Catherine laughed, a hollow laugh. What do you mean? That kind of bohemian beach yoga Buddha thing. Like you were still in your gap year or something. Far away from home. You looked pretentious and just showed you weren't happy for yourself. Your real self. But now you're home. You dress like a woman. Like how a woman should be. I guess you were a child mentally. Now you have class. I've given you that. Said Michael. This pained her. It was weird for him to say something that actually affected her. But that cut. Digging at the real her. Trying to say this fake, hollow bitch she had become was better. Thanks, darling. And that's all down to you. So thank you so, so much, said Catherine. Michael smirked and shoved steak in his mouth. She thought then he was something of an idiot. When Michael finished his dinner, he noticed Catherine's glass was empty. He went to the fridge and took the bottle. Rather than pouring her a glass, he shoved the bottle in her mouth and tipped it. She laughed in fear and tried to move. A little spilt. Frightened more might spill. She played along as he tipped the wine bottle higher. All of it, said Michael. With the bottle empty, he pulled out her chair. Get upstairs and take your clothes off, said Michael. Catherine wanted to say go to hell, but the words weren't there. She tried again, but couldn't. Tears grew in her eyes, but before he could see them, she stood up. She made her way out the kitchen and ran upstairs, crying as quietly as possible.